Let's take it back to 1967, where Edward de Bono coins the term lateral thinking in his piece, The Use of Lateral Thinking. De Bono's research concluded that the brain is a self-organizing system that routinely interprets and inputs data into patterns that is inherently not designed for creativity. Lateral thinking is the definition of the deviation of conventional or traditionally accepted thoughts, which encourages creativity. In 1970, De Bono publishes a piece called Lateral Thinking Step by Step, detailing his whole uh, lateral thinking model. The model of creativity can be described as disrupting linear pathways and creating asymmetric ones, which is vertical versus lateral thinking, and disrupting vertical thinking with lateral thinking. Our brains, as indicated in my book, The Big Trade, Simple Strategies for Maximum Market Returns, are highly developed for pattern recognition, and thus what we should strive to do is be cognizant of that and try to interpret new paths or probably more simpler paths to achieve whatever it is that we so desire. My guest today is James Altucher. He actually is the synthesis of this whole concept of lateral thinking due to many of the unconventional thoughts that and ideas that he conveys publicly through his, his websites and throughout the media. Oftentimes, we might think that what he has to say um, is, is very disruptive to, to our current understanding of, of the world and our paradigm of the world around us. But if, if you take a look and listen to some of the facts, he often provides some very interesting information that we could all consider to use in our businesses, in our investing practices, or just in life in general. I think one of the great points to take a look at is to observe lateral thinking in, in practice. So I actually took a look at the average age of the highest, most powerful person, arguably, in the world, which is the president of the United States. Typically, his average age is about 55 years old. And what's even more interesting than, than the young age is the period of time presidents spend in politics prior to becoming president. You would think that for someone with such a title, they would have to spend almost a lifetime of service in political office prior to becoming the president. But surprisingly, many people that achieve this level of, of recognition through becoming the president spend less than five years in political office which is extremely interesting. And if you actually observe the path that they use to become the president, for example, President Obama or George W. Bush, you could clearly see that they're not taking these traditional paths, even going further when we look at guys like Ronald Reagan, where you have a Hollywood actor that spends most of his time in Hollywood going into politics. So I think that the the guests we have today would be a perfect person to discuss about some interesting ideas that you can actually take and apply and implement into your whole life overall. And I hope you enjoy this interview and let me know if you have any additional comments or questions. Thank you very much. You are now listening to The Big Trade with Peter Pham, enlightening conversations for maximum market returns. Peter, first off, thanks for having me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. So I appreciate you spending the time. And uh, I, uh, I've written 13 or 14 books I've run a bunch of different uh, businesses, both successfully and unsuccessfully. Many of them have been total failures. I've done some day trading in my life. I've run a hedge fund. I've run a fund of hedge funds. I've run a venture capital firm, and I do a lot of angel investing. And I'm currently on the boards of a couple of companies, both public and private. So 
I, when people say failures, they say that you tend to learn a lot out of that. Do you, how do you think that's all aggregated into where you've come today and the person you've become today? You know, I think failure as a stepping stone to success is overhyped right now. There's kind of like this failure porn on the internet where people kind of thump their chests and talk about their biggest failures and say, but if it wasn't for that failure, I would not be here today. So I I get it, but I think more important than, and look, fail, failure is just plain out horrible. Like we all go through these moments of extreme stress and failure and they don't feel good and they never really feel good. I, I, I prefer to think that solving hard problems is a better way to view, uh, you know, like stepping stones for success. So a great example might be, and this is kind of this is kind of an outlier example, but it, it makes the point. You know, Thomas Edison had to test the electric light bulb. I don't know, something like 999 times and it always failed. But then on the thousandth time it worked. I prefer to think that he wasn't failing those 999 times, but he was solving a hard problem. How does electricity, you know, conduct in this light bulb? And and he did it and solved the problem and started General Electric or, you know, however many companies he started. So so so, yeah, I've, I've had horrible failures that, that felt really bad. And, and it was and it also felt really good to come off the floor eventually and kind of you know, solve the hard problems that I had placed myself in. But at the moment that I was failing, it felt really, really bad. And I, I definitely wouldn't want to repeat it. And I definitely don't recommend it for anyone. In terms of that, and you talk about trading as well and investing, do you allow yourself to make these mistakes? And are you going to try to like cut your losses from that perspective? Are you Are you going to actually try to explore the bottom pit of whatever... Um, bad experience that you're going to have? Well, I think it, 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 it changes as I go through these things. So um, now I cut my losses much more quickly when something looks like a failure. Uh, and, and when I say cut my losses, I don't necessarily mean financially, but I also mean, you know, in time and maybe emotionally, you know, if, if someone's a bad uh, partner uh, for whatever reason, I, I won't pursue it much further after it looks like it's going to be worthless to me because you know life life is short and you don't necessarily realize that when you're like let's say 20 years old life feels like it's going to go on forever but Mm -hmm. you know as you get older and have more experiences it feels like rather than preparing for a good life uh it's more important to prepare for a good death and i don't mean this in a depressing way i you know maybe i'll be alive another 80 years for all i know but Mm -hmm. i do mean that you have to consider every second that is precious. And if you if you spend it wallowing in failure or trying to pour good money after bad, uh, you know, it's just it's just more a waste of time than anything else. And it's depressing. And you just don't want to spend that much of your life depressed and trying to climb out of a hole. Mm. So, James, you recently wrote a book called Choose Yourself, where you talk about how individuals can change the world. Can you talk about some of those concepts that you presented in the book? Sure. And it's it's more about if you change yourself, then that is the key to changing the world. So a lot of people let's just take a what's like a big global topic, like let's say the environment. So I don't have a stance or, or I'm not going to give a stance one way or the other on the environment. But a lot of people get very angry, like, oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. When the reality is we don't really know what the answers are. Like it's a hugely complicated issue. We're dealing with the entire planet is filled with millions of gases and animals and, you know, atmosphere. And we don't know what all the solutions are. We know some things that are a little bit good and a little bit bad. But we don't know what, what all the answers are. So my focus is if you change yourself and this could you this often happens when someone's at a low point they realize oh all of my best thinking is what got me to this low point so now I have to do these things to change myself if you change yourself that's going to reverberate out to other people in your life and they'll start to change they'll see the changes in you and it will change them and so on it'll be kind of like 
throwing a rock in, in, in the pool and it ripples out to the sides of the pool. So, so when I was at a low point, like, you know, I had one business that were many businesses, but I'm thinking one time I had a business that, that failed miserably. And I was just thinking to myself, how can I do this again? I mean, I lost, I was broke. I was losing everything. And, uh, it, I realized, you know, what, what worked for me when things were going well. So I realized what worked for me and, and I started applying it again and it worked for me again. But I realized what worked for me was what I call in, in the book, True Yourself, I call it the daily practice. So it's this idea of being physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually healthy every single day. Like you can't, like every day, it's a daily practice because if you stop practicing, you lose your muscles. Uh, so physically healthy doesn't necessarily mean, you know, running 10 miles a day. It just means sleep well, have, you know, have good sleep hygiene, um, eat well, uh, you know, move around, exercise. Again, not going to the gym, but making sure you just don't get out of shape. Uh, so that's physical health. Emotional health is very simple, and, but, and yet most people have a hard time with it. Be around people as much as you can. Be around people who you love and trust and who love and trust you. Uh, spiritual health is, uh, you know, a lot of people think of that as religion, but you can also just think of it as, you know, whenever you feel thoughts of anxiety or nervousness or failure or anger or regret coming up, try to notice it and replace it with a feeling of gratitude. And so some people call that mindfulness. There's lots of words for it, but just keeping in mind to be as grateful as possible, particularly in those moments when you're when you're kind of cycling down to regret and anxiety and anger. And look, this doesn't affect just people who are down and out. I had dinner this weekend with someone worth five hundred million dollars, and yet he was filled with regret that he messed up a little bit and he wasn't worth a billion dollars. So it happens to that it almost seems like, oh my God, that guy shouldn't be that way. But you know, we're all human beings. And so we we all have our ups and downs. It's just part of our biology. And so recognizing when you have a down cycle in your biology, the most important thing you can do is to do these things. And then finally, uh, mental health doesn't refer to your sanity, although it could, but I sort of view that it's very important to constantly be coming up with ideas. Most people, well, well, everybody, if you, if you're sick and you're in bed for two weeks, just two weeks, then you actually need physical therapy to walk again because your leg muscles atrophy so quickly. And it's the same thing with your idea muscle, your creativity muscle. If you don't exercise it, it atrophies. So I recommend writing down 10 ideas a day. What should those 10 ideas be about? Well, it just so happens, actually, my wife, Claudia Altucher, just wrote a book, uh, Become an Idea Machine. And she gives, uh, in that book, 180 prompts to help people uh, start exercising their idea muscle. Uh, And I think doing that is incredibly important to keep creative. And and that's how you start having the ideas to build businesses, to help other people, to save the environment, to save others, and and so on. And, you know, as part of all of this, when you when you become an idea machine, you don't hoard your ideas. So you'll you'll be able to give your ideas freely and frequently to, to everybody around you because you'll know you'll keep coming up with ideas. That's fascinating. I've been using this app. It's kind of like the, the analogy they use for it is called like mental flossing, which is similar to like brushing your teeth during the morning and the evening. It, but prior to it started to talk about like the goals that you have for the day, you actually talk about what you're grateful first and foremost, and then you talk about what you would make you more happy for the rest of the day. Then you can talk about some of your objectives. So it's kind of like an interesting little app that I have on my iPhone that's kind of like a ritual that I've been at least attempting to try to do. Um, but I think it fits a lot in with your paradigm. And actually, it starts to clear your, your mind, and it does give you some, I guess, mindfulness as well. And it also helps you achieve the targets that you need. Um, so, yeah, very, very much but, uh, on the lines of what yeah, you're talking about. It, 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 it is. And that's, that's a good way to start the day. I try to start the day uh, being mindful of those things. And, uh, 
And again, it's it's not only a daily practice, it's an hourly practice. So I just try as frequently as possible to to do these things and make sure I'm staying on track. Because I know when I get off track, I fail. Like it just doesn't work out for anybody. Right, right. James, you seem to be really diverse, especially as when you explain your bio to everyone. And, you know, there's a lot of people that are going to talk about, like, specialization. You seem to be a little bit more of a, a generalist. And I know you kind of address this in, in Choose Yourself as well. Why, why is that your, I guess, your whole approach to, to business and life? And, and in terms of Choose Yourself, are there ramifications in terms of what's happening in the new economy? And it, has that kind of been a a byproduct on why you are the way that you are. Well, you know, it's interesting because look at the history of the human race. Now, in the 1800s, everybody worked in a factory or not everybody, but let's say 90 percent of the people were serfs or worked in factories in the U.S., worked on farms or factories. And you would specialize in one thing and that's all you would do from six in the morning till 10 at night and then you'd come back and go to work the next day. But for millions of years before that, I mean, the entire reason humans evolved, were the only animal to evolve a prefrontal cortex is the prefrontal cortex is for adaptation, um, particularly, particularly uh, environmental adaptation. So we could move out of Africa and moved to Europe and Asia and North America and cold uh, environments and warm environments. But that also applies to what we do in life. You know, people have many different interests. And I find often when I combine interests and sometimes I call this idea sex, when you combine ideas on different interests, it results in new ideas, baby ideas that could grow up to be great businesses. But I find that uh, in life, the combination of my interests usually result in my best uh, financial outcomes as one thing and also my best relationships and friendships and so on. So, so I, I think actually being – being I think there's a whole myth of focus uh, that actually being diverse is really important. I mean the, and let's just talk about money for a second. The average, uh, let's say, multimillionaire uh, – has about seven different sources of income. And, you know, if you think about, compare that to someone who's at a job, well, someone who's at a job has one source of income and they have a full-time job, so they can't get seven jobs. It's impossible. They can't work, you know, seven full-time days. So that's the difference. You know, that's why someone who's at a regular job, they have such a hard time kind of breaking out to have, uh, you know, let's say tens of millions of dollars. The flip side is there's a lot more opportunity for failure, risk, depression, everything. I mean, it's just horrible trying to, you know, live like how humans live for two million years. Two million years ago, humans didn't have a pleasant life either. But but that's sort of like the way we've been evolved to live. Do you think when you're talking about like the whole like seven jobs for or sorry, seven uh, forms of income for for the average millionaire, how would you suggest that a person that currently has a job start to consider how to diversify and also is is them by them having one of these jobs doesn't that restrict them to some extent from from a perspective of capital right there's going to be probably a lot of people in the audience thinking look i don't have enough capital i don't have enough time how can i scale all this to be to create some kind of parity amongst these these millionaires that you're talking about right so 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 that's a great question and it's the question every single person starting from scratch has to ask themselves at some point or other so so for instance i started totally from scratch. I was working a a full-time job. I had zero dollars in the bank. I was living paycheck to paycheck. Literally, I was living in a, you know, one room apartment with a roommate and I would keep all my clothes in a garbage bag, including a suit. And I'd, I'd pull that suit out in the morning and put it on and walk to my job. And then on the side, I started a business with somebody that I knew. And um, so I'd work my job from, from nine to five or, or sometimes from, from eight to five. And then at night I would go over to, uh, my business partner's office 
and we'd work on our side business. And it was slow and steady, uh, you know, and sometimes not so steady. And uh, 18 months later, I finally quit my full time job to go to my startup business. And that I had to feel that confident in it because I was I was very risk averse. So I had to I feel that confident in it to uh, by that point, we had over a dozen employees. And so so and I was the CEO. So I had to feel that confident in it, though, before I would leave my, my full time job. So it's an effort. Like I, a lot of times people write me like, oh, I have this great idea. I should get funding and just start and quit my job and just start it off. It doesn't really work that way. Like you kind of have to get customers and you kind of have to prove yourself that you can that this is a good idea that's going to make money and then look by that point by the time you've proven yourself you might not need the money you might have you know the cheapest money is customer money so you know that you, you know you might wait till you have customer money before you make the leap mm, that's very interesting um but but every single person in the world who goes on to become a success started off with that question. I don't have the money. I don't have the resources. I have responsibilities. I have like wife and kids or husband and kids to, to pay for. Uh, I can't do this. And, and figuring your way around the word can't is, is the way you do it. And part of that is becoming this idea machine. So let's, let's take it step by step. For example, James, we've, we talked about, generating ideas. I know that you typically do that. How about let's run it through. Let's, let's take a scenario in which you have this guy um, that feels as if he has limited time, capital, and resources. Um, and he's basically sitting there on his bedside coming up with his 10 ideas. How are we going to turn this into a $10 million business? And then what do we have to do not to blow it? Um. Great question. So I'll give you two examples from my own life. So one time, so I'll talk about that first business. Uh, the internet was uh, just coming around. This was like 1996. Uh, I had a full time job, um, but I would think of all these companies that would need websites. And at the time, I knew how to program websites. Not that many people did. And my business partner knew how to design websites. And so we would just approach companies. Sometimes cold, sometimes through a network. You know, over time you build a network. So you do one or two websites. So we did one or two websites. And then we would ask our customers, hey, who else can use us? We'd ask for advice from our customers. And the way we would not blow it, because we were so we worked so hard and we were so desperate to make this work, we would always overpromise and overdeliver. So, you know, there's a saying under promise and over deliver. Mm-hmm. I don't like under promising because that's lying. And everybody knows when you're lying. So you underpromise and overdeliver. That's what people expect. But if you overpromise and the, and you they you leave the meeting and they're like, oh my god, he how, did he just say that? Did he just promise that? And then on top of it, you overdeliver. You've got a customer for life. And then you can go to them when you have, once you have a customer for life, you can go to them and say, hey, we want to stay in business. What would you advise? Like who else do you know? And they're gonna they're gonna help you. They're, they're on your side at that point. You're, they're on the team, and you kind of build your your family business, or, or sorry, your business family that way. And you know that's how you build more and more customers and so on. So I'll give you another another time, James. James, let me let me ask you. You just talked about over promise and over deliver. What about in the public markets, uh, primarily in, in listed stock secondary market where? If, if as a company you overpromise and and somehow underdeliver, you're going to get punished for that on Wall Street, for example. And even if you overpromise, sometimes you set the expectations so high that even if you overdeliver, the bar for overdelivering becomes that much higher. And as maybe your customers will be fine with it, but your shareholders might be extremely frustrated. What do you think about right, that? Right, but there's but there's there's no way to game that really. Like for instance, Microsoft for many years was classic under promise and over deliver. But it became so common that they would like downplay next quarter's earnings that mm. if they didn't beat by a huge margin, their stock would go down. So so you know there, I don't know what to say because that's a trading game. 
what you still want to, you, uh, so I'm not focused so much on shareholders, but, but cu- when I'm building a business, I'm focused on customers. And so mm-hmm. shareholders, the share price will take care of itself in the long run if you service your customers very well. So for instance, you know, Google, you can argue, services their customers very well. Amazon services their customers very well. So Amazon's a classic case where I don't even know yet if they make money or certainly they don't make that much. And yet they're such a great service to their customers, their share price ultimately reflects that. And I think every stock sooner or later catches that wave where people realize, oh my gosh, they're like an amazing company and the share price catches up. So, so still the key of, of over-promising and over-delivering. I'm not talking about what you communicate to shareholders. I'm talking about what you communicate to customers because the, the share price will catch up. The, the value of your company will catch up. Okay, okay. Uh, please I'll, continue I'll, I'll, with yeah. your next example. Yeah, so, 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 so my next example was is a time later on when I had, I had made, I had sold that first business, I had made some money, but then I totally bombed and failed and went, I won't get into the whole details, but I went totally broke, was losing a home, everything. And I, I had to figure out what to do. And I didn't, I didn't even know what skills I had because nobody was paying attention to the internet anymore. And so, uh, I didn't know anything about the financial markets, you know, the business you're in with the hedge funds. So I, I read basically probably four or 500 books about finance. And you might think there's not even four or 500 books about finance, but I would read books dating back to like the 1800s about finance, like the whole history, everything I could find, I would read about finance and, and stocks and the markets and so on. And then I wrote some software uh, to model the markets. And I didn't just do that. I came up with tons and tons probably dozens of trading ideas. This was my idea machine at work. And then I would freely share these trading ideas with other investors and other investment writers and so on. I was just totally like, here's a trading system. I've back tested it. Do what you want with it. And most people would ignore me. Like one out of, you know, you know, 29 out of 30 people would ignore me. But one out of 30 people would respond to me. And eventually... People would give me money to invest and trade. And suddenly from being totally broke and honestly, I was going to lose everything. Like I was down to $143 in the bank and, and with no job prospects. And then suddenly I started making money doing this uh, because people gave me money to invest. And, and a year earlier, two years earlier, I, I should say two or three years earlier, I knew nothing about investing. But then through hard work, uh, I – you know, and a lot of this was at, at at night and in my spare time, I started investing, and and That's, eventually, and I was investing everything. Like I was learning, so I, I wrote software, but also I was doing convertible arbitrage. I was doing something I called preferred stock arbitrage. I was investing in micro caps. I was investing um, in closed end funds. Uh, I was doing every type of investing you could imagine uh, I was doing uh, value investing, you know, growth invest, everything. And uh, and it worked. You know, some some ideas worked, some didn't. And the ones that worked, I kept at. And eventually people allocated money to me and I, I built a business doing that. And then I got sick of that. But I knew so much about hedge funds at that point. I started a fund of hedge funds. And people knew I was an expert because I built up my network during this time. And so people gave me money to invest in, you know, a dozen or so hedge funds for them. And I I built a business. That that, James, that's almost exactly word for word. I I recently published a book called The Big Trade. I pretty much highlight this as kind of like my my, um, um, you know, first several years, just going through reading almost every single book exploring every single possibility that there is in terms of capital markets and trying to grab some kind of essence to to you know principles of both investing and and trading and and eventually you start to hone it in and and start to then be able to communicate about some of your interesting discoveries um, you know about like companies that are generating economic goodwill, but also companies that have the highest probability of, say, for example, go appreciating within the next 
say, period of time. So, so I feel a lot of, I, I feel some kind of kinship here, James, in terms of what we're talking about, because m- maybe I had double the amount that you had one time recently where I only had $300 in my pocket, but mm. solely by utilizing your own passion and, and utilizing in, in psychology, we call it like a synaptic network of all your ideas, all your experiences about what you understand about business, which then can be connected to investing, which then can be connected to like, you know, public markets, for example. So, so, yeah, I, you know, I, like, like, it's funny because you said you asked earlier about um, specialization. Well, what if you happen to know a lot about the stock market and a lot about geology? Two completely different things. Well, you could become the best investor in the world in oil companies. So, right. you know, you know how people connect the dots, that's kind of the essence of success. But you could only connect those dots if you're like an idea machine. And like you, 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 uh, you know, you mentioned how you know, you kind of looked at all these different ideas. It's funny how there's like 8,000 public companies, but if you go to the Wall Street Journal, all they talk about is Google, Apple, you know, Cisco, Microsoft, uh, GE, Exxon. And then there's another 8,000 public companies. Look where, and that's just in the US. And look where you are right now, you're in Asia. So that opens up the universe uh, to like 20,000 public companies you can look at. So there's a world of opportunity out there if you do the, if you do the work. Yeah, exactly. I I think one of the key issues, though, and and entrepreneurs say, I kind of get annoyed when I have to talk to people about, say, for example, investing into public markets and then just capturing capital gains on stocks. Because entrepreneurs will go, well, you know, I'm going to make like 30, 40 percent in terms of profit margin if I was to do X, Y, Z business. And and I think that... um, people get often confused, right? E- either they're going to try to go the entrepreneurial route, which is fine, and then they also get confused about what the markets can provide you. And I, I think if you can develop, you know, various different strategies and approaches, you first and foremost can uh, collect the income that you need from from public markets. But, you know, entrepreneurship is is also a very viable route. But I think that the whole concept and 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 how you view them should be separate rather than comparing the opportunity cost of both because they they provide kind of like different things different different forms of income for you to some extent because you know yeah i'm sure james you're going to get that question from investors you're going to say hey so uh what's the typical return i'm going to get from your fund and if you give them a number that is not adequate enough they're going to say well my business can do xyz which is annoying, actually. <laughs> it is annoying. And, you know, also, I mean, I've had so many examples where I would pitch a, an investor and they would say, well, why should I invest in you? And this is back in the day. Why should I invest in you when I return 20 percent a year? Well, two years later, that guy would be in jail because it wasn't a real 20 percent a year. But that's the right. comp- often the competitors to good hedge funds are, are Ponzi schemes. And so that's the difficult thing in the hedge fund business is those Ponzi schemes aren't discovered, but they scoop up all the money. And that happens yeah. more frequently than people think. There's so much noise, actually, in this industry, James, where people are it becomes so difficult for people to decipher like, you know, what are the good apples? What are the bad apples? You know, and it's it's hard to to not try to sit around and want to discredit anyone else when it's just so obvious that like, you know, X, Y, Z firm might not be able to make you the kind of returns that you need. And maybe because they're not in the real business of actually investing and they're more in the business of collecting your capital to generate fees. So, you know, in, in, frontier and emerging markets. It's all about closed in funds. It's all about being able to aggregate as much capital as possible initially and then having a six year lockup, basically. And then what you're gonna have is they're gonna go into private equity. They're gonna try to overvalue some of these assets by actually paying the valuers, you know, a respectable fee to guide them on how those assets are valued, which then creates a significant, you know, discount to NAV. And all you have are like disgruntled investors that get a very bad impression about these markets. Yeah, I mean, um, and look, I always think uh, the best investment you can make is in yourself and in your own entrepreneurship. So I don't like now investing in any 
uh, funds or anything like that. Just because, like you say, there's so much noise, it's hard to figure. It's hard to figure it out. In, in terms of choose yourself as well as uh, I, I know that you you kind of wrote that as kind of like a guidebook for individuals. Is that how it could be used? I guess so, except I didn't view, I don't view it as like, here's what you should do. Like I'm on a pedestal and everyone else should do this. I kind of, I started off talking about when I was really sort of down and out and I say, here's what I did. And and I even say you could do, try this or not. This is simply what I did. And then I do that, and then I tell stories about other people who did it. So so I kind of avoid the self help thing, but mm-hmm. again, just try, try to describe things in terms of like what I did myself. Okay, great. So James, I, I know we gotta get going soon. Final question: You've talked to a sure. lot of people, really diverse kinds of people from, I guess, like musicians all the way up to um, um, finance people. Who, who's some of the more interesting people that you talk to and what did you take away from them? Oh, my God. Everybody has been so interesting. Like, and I can't really say who's and I'm not even saying this in like some, oh, I don't want to insult anyone way. Right. Like everybody's been so inter- I I've kind of been uh just whoever's book I was reading at the time, I would just call them up and say, hey, can I interview you? Because I'm so into this book. And uh, I talked to so many people that just blew me away. That uh, and, and very diverse. Like I've talked to investors and I've talked to um, c- comedians and fiction writers and nonfiction right. book writers and uh, you know, other, other, you know, venture capitalists, just all, anybody who kind of interested me in anything I, I would talk to. So, so on the top of your mind, any outlier, any kind of like quirky story about talking to any of these individuals that, that just come pops into your head right now? Well, in terms of quirkiness, um, I was talking to Coolio, the rapper, you know who he right. is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 1995, he had the, the best selling song of the year, Gangster's Paradise. And um, he told me at the end of the interview, he was like, you know, at first I thought you were kind of obnoxious. And he's telling this to me. And I'm like, and, and then he said, but, you know, you got me to say some really deep shit. So kudos to you. Uh, and then he just started talking about some girl he was looking at at that moment. And it was a, <laughs> kind of a funny moment. Was it, it, you know, in terms of something I learned, I would say a common theme among many of the people I spoke to is that, you know, one should measure success in decades and not even years or months or whatever. Like I'll, I'll use Coleo as an example. Again, he was, he started writing lyrics down every single day in 1977, but he didn't have a single hit until 1994. So that's 17 years of writing lyrics down every day and practicing his skills before he had a hit. Now, he also happened to have the biggest hit of, of the world in, in, in the next year, 1995. So you don't have to do something for, for 17 years because not everyone's going to have the single best-selling song in the entire planet. But it does suggest that people should be a little more gentle with themselves and be a little bit more patient. And when you're really interested in something and you're pursuing it, it's okay to, to not do well at first just keep on doing it because you love it not because you have any kind of goal with it but just because you you love doing it so we're kind of talking about like mastery here about beyond that 10,000 hours right and so so the the interesting thing there is sure 10,000 hours is what the Beatles did what what Steve Jobs did what Bill Gates did but you know not everybody is a Bill Gates you know, and if you just do a hundred hours, like, you know, and remember that's 10,000 hours uh, that, so that, that comes from Malcolm Gladwell I was quoting some other guy. Mm-hmm. He basically says, if you do 10,000 hours of practice with intent, so that means purposeful practice where you're really, you know, working with someone better than you or really studying a, an art form or, or whatever, you'll become one of the best in the world if you put 10,000 hours into it. But let's say you just did 100 hours of practice with intent. Um, you know, for instance, let's say you studied tennis 
for a hundred hours with a good, a really good coach, you're probably going to be a decent. If you're in shape in general, you're probably going to be a decent tennis player after a couple hundred hours of practicing with intent, like good enough to to beat the average, you know, weekend player. Uh, so, you know, and then let's say now you make that 500 hours or a thousand hours, you'll be one of the best uh, that in your industry. You may not be the best in the world, but you'll be, you know, one, you know, maybe in the top, you know, 1,000 or 10,000, which is good enough. To not only make a living, but maybe to make real wealth and make friends and and so on. So I'm not a big believer in the 10,000 hour rule because, okay, so I might not be the world champion of anything, but I'm going to be pretty good at a lot of things. And then I'll be the world champion at the intersection of those things because chances are no one else will be in that intersection. That's interesting. What I kind of do is I just said, look, I'm really into finance so everything that I do is going to have some, you know, even if it's a general connection, it's going to have some kind of connection in, to some well, extent. Right. And then that just builds up into eventually being some, some kind of like capital markets expert to some extent. You know what I mean? Sure. And, well, the, Peter, let me, let me ask you, where, where did you go to college, for instance? I went to, I was actually born in Canada. So I went mm-hmm. to college and I studied information systems and human behavior in a university called the University of Guelph. Okay. And, and where Ontario. are you, where are you calling from right now? I'm calling you from Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. <laughs> right. So, so you're like, if, if I was in Canada and I drilled a hole through the center of the world and went down that hole all the way to the other side of the planet, I would end up in Vietnam where you are. So, Perhaps. so you basically when uh, you know, you studied human behavior. Now uh-huh. you're in Vietnam uh-huh. and you're interested in the capital markets. So of course, uh-huh. all of those things are connected and it, and there's an intersection there where you're probably among the best. Like, I don't know any other investors who are, you know, hang, you know, any other Canadian investors who are in, hanging out in Vietnam right now. So there, there's something <laughs> to that. And, and I'll probably end up spending more time in the U S because of the yeah. the way that the show is developed in which I'm talking to like celebrities like James Altucher, for example, and it's it's fascinating. No, well, you've easy, had a lot of good investors on you've had a lot of good investors on your podcast. I know, you know, we were talking earlier, you're trying lots of different things for your business. So again, it, it sort of begs the question, are you an entrepreneur or are you someone who's looking at many different sources of potential income and seeing how they can work together and combine and, and sort of riding those waves to surf down the river. You know, I don't know, I'm, I'm mixing every metaphor, but, uh, you know, I'm almost against the word entrepreneurship because you're, you're not focused on any one thing. You're doing lots of things and seeing where it takes you. I think it's more about like creating as much value as possible. Right. So, so we think that there's a very big, um, you know, niche demographic that we can address in some shape or form. And I, I don't even, some, some of these things, James, I don't even think as, as businesses, I just think about what is the, the, the market that needs the service and, and how can we facilitate that with basically what we know based on our experiences. And I'm, you're almost exactly the same way. I'm just trying to articulate that to, to some extent. Right. Like, so, so, so I like how you're eliminating the word business and replacing with value. It's almost like the business, you know, what actually becomes the official business comes later. But first there's the ideas, then there's the value you bring, then there's kind of pitching that value and figuring out kind of the subtle outline of the execution of that value. And then finally, you kind of figure out a business or two that, okay, could be under one umbrella that, and that's your business. So, yeah. you know, that's what you, that's what you legally incorporate, but that's like the last thing that's like all the way down the, the road and it might be multiple businesses. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a, a byproduct because you know, a base, even based on my nationality is that many people in my nationality, you know, a country like Vietnam has been through so many different wars and, you know, the, there, most people that immigrate to places like the U S post the war, they're just thinking about how they're going to put food on the table, James. And, and their understanding about like, you know, 
business capital markets and and how to utilize them, especially in this this environment of monetary easing, is is really unsophisticated because they have some kind of stigma about you know institutions in general, and and that that's that's. I, that that's one of the the motives is to ge- demonstrate that you know some first generation or second generation Canadian that's a byproduct of you know uh, global wars is going to be able to achieve something that's somewhat meaningful um, besides just thinking about because because many people as you know just like the Italians when they first came to America they they were probably in many different like illegal businesses for example just to scrape by and get by but i, I think that if if you're using your like kind of like choose yourself approach and are generating 10 ideas a day and thinking about how you can create value even though it's considered almost like high level thinking it actually can work and it can actually start to make a, a reputation for a particular nationality. So you've seen that in like the African American community where they've had many different outliers that have rise to to stardom and success based on what they've done. And it's almost inspired that that demographic of people to to want to achieve so much more. But you really don't hear that as much from from and I'm sure you're gonna hear about this same issue like for Imagine the people that have immigrated over to America from Iraq, right? Like, and like 10, 20 years from now, the kind of impact that they're going to make. Uh, there's a girl named Michelle Fan. I'm sure you've heard of her. She's kind of like a oh, yeah, yeah. sensation I, I, for doing makeup. I love her videos and her book. Yeah, yeah. Because my, my 12-year-old kind of, daughter showed me her. Exactly. Well, that's kind of like where like these American Vietnamese people are. They're so, well, some of them are obviously getting in trouble for 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 we- growing marijuana, for example. But but there's some people that are actually doing some interesting thing. And and I think that if you have people that are trying to create as much value as possible that transcends even beyond a nationality, then it it actually you know, can be meaningful and it can be uh, a, a guiding post to, to where other people want to, from the same national they want to go. So that's kind of like a little background about, you know, what we're trying to do. And, and I, you know, we're almost ex- overextending this call right now. So thank you so much, James, for this conversation. It was really interesting. Somehow I managed to stay awake talking to you at uh, 4 a.m. in the morning. I will talk to you soon, Peter. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this mastermind session. If you'd like to contact Peter Pham or Phoenix Capital, please email info at phx-cap.com.